Hey everyone, and welcome to A History of Typography. I think understanding the history is really important for graphic designers because it makes you a better designer. First and foremost, it gives you context for where these typefaces came from, which helps you decide what to choose on your projects. But as contemporary designers, you are now a part of the history and a part of that heritage. And that's something that's very empowering as a designer. So the word typography is Greek. It comes from typos, meaning impression, and graphia, meaning writing. Before we go too far, I just want to give you a sense of the timeline that we're working at. We're going to be cruising through about 4,000 years of visual communication. Now, most of what we're going to cover is from Europe, and it's going to be from the perspective of Western civilization. But I would really be remiss if I didn't mention everything that was going on in East Asia 500 to even a thousand years before what we're going to talk about in Europe. Now the Asians were very ahead of their time in terms of language uh, and printing technology. This woodblock printing you see here was from the Han Dynasty in China about 2,000 years ago. This was printed on cloth um, but they would also develop paper as you know. They developed hemp paper 400 years after this would have been printed. So what was the motivation for pushing this printing technology and disseminating this information? Well, in the case of Asia, it was to spread the message of Buddhism. Now we're going to see a parallel story in Europe with the need to spread Christianity. But it's interesting how in the earliest days, this was the primary function and motivation for printing technology, religion. Now this is interesting here. This is a diagram of essentially a lazy Susan for Asian typography. Now the Asians first made their type out of ceramic. So just like in a letterpress studio, you might see little bits of metal type. Their earliest forms were ceramic and you could take out uh, the piece that you wanted to say, print it into the page as much as you wanted and it was reusable. And then you can put the ceramic piece back, file it away until you need to use it again. Now back to the Buddhists. This example, about 700 years old from Korea, is called the Selected Teachings of Buddhist Sages and Sion Masters. So this is the earliest known book that was printed with movable type. Now we're going to switch time periods and geographic locations. So we're going to go to about the year 1400, roughly 600 years ago, and we're going to go to Central Europe. So this guy here is a scribe, and basically his job was to copy books, he did some administrative stuff, but again, his primary purpose was to copy religious texts, you know, such as the Bible. So these Bibles, they would get decorated with illustrations and they would gold leaf them, and they were called illuminated manuscripts. At the time, this was a very respected profession, but clearly as printing came along, they kind of got pushed out by the technology. We saw that in the Industrial Revolution, and now we're seeing it again with, you know, autonomous cars taking the jobs of Uber drivers and truck drivers. Now these monks used to work in these rooms specifically for writing called scriptoriums. This example here is a handwritten Bible from the year 1407, written in Latin. You can see the decoration there in the second column. Again, all handwritten, both incredible and beautiful. This is a close-up of that same Bible and in this decoration here, this is what we call an initial cap or a drop cap. Basically, that guy is standing inside of a giant letter P, and that's to start off the paragraph. And the handwriting around him is in the typical black letter style handwriting. And that style points to that Germanic area of Europe. Now, from the time this Bible was printed, we're going to fast forward just a couple decades uh, to this gentleman, Johannes Gutenberg. He's generally credited as the inventor of the printing press. He would have invented his first press around 1439, about five, 600 years ago. Now, when he first started printing, he was still using that old black letter typeface. An example would be Fractor. Fractor is considered one of the earliest typefaces. And he based that typeface design off the handwriting of those scribes. Now, Gutenberg's working out of the Germanic area 
Uh, he's using metal type, which is mostly made out of lead and tin. That's why in a letterpress studio, they refer to those bits of type as toxic Legos. And here's a replica of one of Gutenberg's early presses. Off to the right here, you can see these trays. Uh, those are for the individual pieces of type, so you can arrange them. And fun fact, this is where the terms uppercase and lowercase came from. The lowercase letters were physically kept in the lowercase and the uppercase letters in the upper case. Now this is an image of one of the Gutenberg Bibles. Now today only 48 original copies survived and they're considered among the most valuable books in the world. Now if I can brag for a minute, I actually got to hold a page of an original Gutenberg Bible at a museum. I mean, it was in a plastic sleeve, but I got to hold the plastic sleeve that held the page from the Gutenberg Bible. It was very exciting. So let's move from Germany. Let's talk about Italy a little bit. If there is one geographic region that really spurred modern typography, it's Italy. Rome was a very vibrant modern city, and just like any other metropolitan city we have nowadays, it attracted outsiders to come there for the culture and maybe to set up their business. Now, people were coming from Germany to go to Italy to set up their shops. And Venice, another big modern city, attracted a Frenchman by the name of Nicholas Jensen, who would go on to create the first Roman typeface called Jensen in the year 1470. So this is only a couple decades after Gutenberg's Bible. Now this column we're looking at is called Trajan's Column. It's about 2,000 years old. And it was a war monument, of course, uh, that was put up in Rome and inscribed uh, with these Roman capital letter forms. These are the primary letter forms that inspired these typographers even 1400 years later. So Jensen, who is living and working in Venice, is maybe taking a trip to Rome, walking around, seeing Trajan's column, and that's inspiring him to create his typeface, Jensen. Now this image on the left is a selfie of Jensen, and the one on the right is his typographer's mark, or his printer's mark. This would be something that he would print onto the page as sort of a logo or signature uh, to identify him as the printer of that page. You know, having your printer's mark on a printed page is like, you know, having the Cadillac logo on the back of a car. Now, Italy was really the place that advanced typography. In fact, the word italics comes from the word Italy. This is an example of one of the earliest forms of italic type. At the time, it was called cursiva humanistica. And this really sprung out of the Renaissance. Again, we're in the 1500s. Now, the interesting thing about italic type is it was originally designed just as a space saver. You know, printing was expensive and you're basically paying by the letter. So they took these letter forms and they sort of slanted them and thinned them out a little bit so you could fit more on the page. So typography came out of Germany, it started to blow up in Italy, and now it's starting to spread out to Switzerland, and it's going into Spain, and it's eventually going to make its way up into England. But on its way, it's going to hit France. And this guy right here, Claude Garamond, who you may know from the typeface Garamond, was commissioned as a typographer by King Francis I in 1541 to create his typeface. I mean, imagine we're living in a time where the kings of these countries see the value in language and communication and they're commissioning typefaces. So Germán actually got a lot of fame from designing his typeface. And even today he's considered one of the greatest type designers in history. And we're still using his typeface in digital form on our computers. And here's an example of Garamond in italic form from the year 1540. Let's move up to England, because now we're getting into the 1700s, and there's going to be a lot of type development in England. This example here is a type specimen page by William Caslon. A type specimen page 
is basically a sample of what a typeface would look like. And this would be something you'd show to your clients or you'd use to sell your typefaces. William Caslon was originally a gun engraver, and it was that skill set of working with metal and carving that led him to become a typographer. Now, Caslon, we know of the typeface Caslon, or it's probably listed on your computer as Adobe Caslon, meaning Adobe took the Caslon font and sort of made their own computerized version of it. So Caslon is a pretty famous designer, and he would also influence another Englishman named John Baskerville. And in the late 1700s, it would be Baskerville who would create what we call the transitional typefaces, um, where he would sort of push the thins and thicks of the letters. It's not what we would consider a modern typeface, but it was definitely an evolution and advancement in the type forms. Now moving forward into the early 1800s, we see the evolution into what we call the modern typefaces. So this is a type specimen of Bodoni's typeface, known as Bodoni. You probably have it on your computer today. Now, Bodoni was Italian, and it had a French counterpart named Didot, and these are great examples of what became the modern typefaces. So extreme variation between the thicks and thins of the letters, um, very straight cut serifs. A lot of times you'll see modern serif typefaces like this in the fashion world. Think of the masthead for Vogue magazine, uh, El Decor, these are all using these modern serif typefaces. You know, they'll look great as a headline, but it's not necessarily something that you'd want to use as body copy. As these modern serifs shrink down and the thin lines become so razor thin that sometimes they get lost in the printing and it breaks down the letters. Okay, so we're in the early 1800s, roughly 200 years ago. You're never going to guess what happened. They cut off the serifs and created the first sans serif font. In fact, the guy who created the first sans serif typeface was William Caslon IV, who was the great grandson of the William Caslon we just mentioned. You gotta be kidding me, that's crazy. Now, I had a little trouble finding the earliest examples of that sans serif. This example is only about a hundred years old. Uh, but you get a sense of how those early ones were used. Now when these typefaces came out, they were originally referred to as grotesque because they were such a radical departure from the traditional serif typography. And funny thing, we still use the term grotesque today as a classification for sans serif typefaces. A great example of that is Accidents Grotesque, which would later evolve into Helvetica. So, the sans serifs, not very popular at the time when they came out, but they will catch on. So now we're in the 1800s, we have industrialization, we have mass printing of newspapers, we have advertising, we have posters. And this is going to bring a lot of new variations of typography such as bolder faces, things that will capture the reader's attention. We see the advent of slab serifs seen here, and we see fonts like Rockwell, which were specifically designed uh, for advertising and newspapers to get people's attention. So the slab serifs have these thick, blocky serifs, and they're primarily used in headlines, not so much in body copy like we see here. So also around this time, we're seeing the advent of typewriters, and typewriters had these mechanical considerations for how they could function. So we had to develop this new type of font called monospaced or fixed width in that every letter of the alphabet was essentially the same width. Now this is the opposite of 98% of all the fonts out there which we refer to as proportional fonts. Nowadays the most famous common monospaced or fixed width fonts would be Courier or Monaco. Of course, they're also less readable and take up more space on the page, so that's why we typically don't use them much anymore. Okay, so then we hit the 20th century, and that's when typography really starts to take off. So in 1927, Paul Renner designs Futura, and he designs it based on simple geometric forms. So the A is the triangle, the N is the square, the O is the circle, and Futura has these really even weight strokes, right? There's not much variation between the thicks and the thins. Now Futura is the favorite typeface of the director Wes Anderson, 
So as you watch his films in the future, keep an eye out, because it's always in there. Now fast forward, mid-century, 1957, Max Medinger designs Helvetica. Here's an example we see from the New York subway system. Helvetica just has that clean, stand-up, almost slightly ambiguous, almost generic look to it. But this is an example of one of these great typefaces that comes along. It stands the test of time and it communicates very well. And therefore it's adopted by all kinds of designers and systems. Also in 1957, Universe is designed by Adrian Frutiger. Now he also designed one of my favorite sans serifs, Avenir. And Universe was notable on its release because it came out with so many weights, so many font family members. When Frutiger put him out, he was one of the first guys to put these numbers at the end to classify their weights. So the smaller the number, 45, the lighter the typeface, and the bigger the number, 93, the heavier the typeface, the bolder the typeface. Now this system was adopted by other type designers, and you can still see this used in some of the typefaces on your computer. Next up, you're never going to guess what happens. Computers. This is the next radical shift in typography, the advent of computer-based fonts. Now this example here has become quite famous. It's called Chicago. It was installed on all the original Macintosh computers. And these first computer-based fonts were essentially pixel arrays that were called bitmapped fonts. And they were designed specifically for the screen and the low resolution screens that we had at the time. Each letter is basically an image that scales up and down. So there are a lot of limitations on what you can do with sizing and format. Um, they are very simple, but they're also not very legible. It's not even fair to compare the legibility of Chicago to say Caslon on a printed page. Now, fun fact, you may see this sentence a lot when you're testing out different typefaces. The quick brown fox jumps over a lazy dog. This is called a pangram. Basically, it's a sentence that includes every letter of the alphabet. So when you're testing out a font, you can use this little sentence and you can really get a quick overview of that entire typeface. Now moving away from these old pixelated bitmapped fonts, we developed what we use today, which are vector-based typefaces, which means they can be scaled up or down in size without resolution. They're essentially based on a mathematical formula as opposed to a pixelated image. And then you'll never guess what happens next. In an ironic twist of fate, remember where we started with the pictographs and the hieroglyphs? Well, now we've come full circle and we have our emojis. 